Hi, everyone. Uh, I won't talk about Brexit, it's a bit depressing. But, uh, yeah, so I'm going to chat to you about Virgin Depart the Everyday. Um, first of all, I'll start off with talking about ETC. I'm not sure if, like, how many of you know about the company. Um, we're, we're basically a post-production company that was set up about seven years ago. Um, We've got sites in uh, London, LA, and now one in Bristol as well. Um, we predominantly, the work that we do is, um, it's obviously very creative. That's our main uh, selling point as, the, as a studio. We try to create incredibly well-produced and um, slick-looking work. And the team that we have working together are uh, very, very uh, talented artists and nurturing of young talent. Um, we have a lot of people that have come from Escape and various other, um, various other sort of universities, and we always try to sort of develop them um, within the team that we've got alongside of our like our, our senior talent. Um, you know, we do. I suppose predominantly a lot of the work that we do is uh, quite traditional um, post-production work. So it sort of it, uh, encompasses CG, 2D, um, animation, color grading, a lot of the things that uh, you're involved in everyday commercials. Um, we also try to do a little bit of TV, which we're sort of getting into at the moment, and we do a lot of music videos. Um, which are really, really interesting bits of work. Um, the company was set up. Uh, set up about seven years ago now um, by four guys who left the mill. Um, they decided they wanted to set their own company up and they had wanted to have their own ethos, like a sort of good family feel and just creating really good work. Um, and, you know, that ethos, I guess, lives on today with, with the team. Like, all, all, the, all the four owners are still there. They own the company. They're working with you every day, running on jobs. And uh, I guess the company, you know, it's not one of these gigantic companies uh, your mills are NPCs, and there's obviously nothing wrong with all that, but it's just a different style of thing in that we're sort of more of a, like, a family unit um, and a sort of smaller creative studio, which is what I think makes Electric so special um, in this sort of industry. Um, so I'll sort of just run you through some of the work that we've done. I'll show you our reel, uh, and then we'll get on and start chatting about Virgin. Um, so I think you can. I think you can see there's quite a lot of um, a huge variety of work that we do. You know, all the way from 
kind of simple music videos with just like a beautiful color grade on all the way through to incredibly complex VFX commercials with cars being blown to pieces and storms and you know all the way then through to stop frame animation style work um, which is great and is what keeps us entertained every day you know working commercials is fun because of the, the, the huge variety of work you get to do um, which kind of leads on to sort of Virgin this is um, this spot came to us in uh, the summer um, and uh, it was a huge challenge we were super excited about it like uh, the whole idea of the commercial was that we're um, departing the everyday we're going on an amazing journey away from our sort of boring everyday lives and going on this wonderful flight of fancy um, up in up in the skies um, you know, it, it was uh, it was super exciting, but at the same time quite nerve wracking because uh, it was quite clear from the outset when we chatted to the directors and the agency about it about how much work was involved because a lot of what they wanted to shoot just couldn't be done for real. Like it just it was impossible. So it was quite clear that a majority of the film was going to have to be um, photo real CG, which is exciting and nerve wracking at the same time. So if you haven't seen the commercial, I'll just run it through and then we can chat through some of the work. So as you can see, it's pretty crazy. Um, oh, I've lost some notes there. Anyway, what's going on? Oh, here you go. Duh, 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 duh. Click, click, click. Sorry. There you go. Um, so yeah, the um, I suppose you can sort of see it's quite a complicated commercial. There's like a huge number of parts to it. And obviously being um, fully real CG, there's a lot they're not going to shoot. Um, so the previs process is so important on a on a commercial like this. Of course, you get your storyboard frames um, from the director and the agency, and they, they can become quite refined. Um, but at the same time, once you start shooting um, and editing, it's, you need something to work with. And so the director will end up working with you really, really closely and crafting um, a lot of those uh, CG shots because uh, you need to sort of, we, you can't just jump straight into creating this beautiful final images. <clears throat> There's a whole journey that we need to go on um, <clears throat> in understanding what needs to be created and what the client want and how the story is told. Because although the storyboards often um, are a really good guide for the story, that will change as you're going along um, and it's brought to life. Now, half of the commercial was filmed on a set in Ukraine. Um, that was all the interior stuff. And there, even though there was, it was uh, filmed there, there's still quite a lot of work in combining that with CG and extending plates and things like that. But as you could see, like a lot of the other stuff um, was really down to purely just CG and building, um, building what the, the whole world and what this world was going to be like. Um, one of the things we did, which previous became really great for was that we worked fully in Houdini so all the animation and the lighting and the clouds and everything was all done in Houdini so we sort of got ourselves into this nice little loop of um, creating an animatic in a very simple form um, and flying the plane through the skies and then putting a matte painting in and that would therefore guide like our lighting scenarios we could then have quick feedback with the director and client we wouldn't even need to render it just an open gel quick render just for everyone to get a feeling for the commercial and as we're going on we're just putting in the clouds um, in proxy form and then everyone's starting to get a real sort of understanding of how the 
uh, shot is evolving as we go. So any problems that come up can really sort of be nipped in the bud early, which is such a nice way of working. And I think, you know, for the clients and stuff, they really appreciate being uh, being able to see all that stuff so early because it can be quite scary when you're talking to someone like Virgin and they just don't understand. They're like, well, ha you're not shooting the plane, but the plane's got to look real. It's like, how are you going to do this? I don't, don't quite understand. So then we go on to... So, this was like, I'm just going to run you through a few of the, the shots that we did in the commercial and just sort of talk through um, the problems that we encountered on those shots and how we uh, went about solving them and all the sort of technical problems that are sort of, uh, you know, which are there in, within each, each section, really. Um, so, you know, this first part of the story is us leaving the everyday, the grey monotony of England and its constant drizzle. Um, and heading off to sort of somewhere fun like America uh, and going off on that journey. So, you know, the first part of this world was really, um, it, was, it was supposed to be moody and, uh, and sort of heavy, I suppose. Um, and, you know, like when you start out on these things, you're obviously gathering reference is one of the sort of most important starting points for any commercial or any bit of work that you start doing. It's like you shouldn't really do anything until you've gathered as much reference as you can to sort of understand the world that you're trying to build. You know, there's like, you can look at all the sort of different types of clouds and the, the lighting and, um, you know, the different kinds of plane shots that have been filmed before or photographs that might inspire you to sort of understand how the plane should be moving and what the cloud should look like and, how, you know, what the sort of physicalities of the shot are. Um, uh, you know, so that sort of guides us on to the look of it and sort of like it, the images are a really great starting point. Um, the other thing is that there's obviously so much video reference out there now and it's kind of amazing that we've sort of got access to it all because when you're trying to build something photorealistic, it's obviously to actually watch videos of things that have been shot for real uh, really help. Also, it's great to watch movies that have done things in VFX that are just so um, out of this world and look beautiful already. Um, you know, one of, the, one of the spots that the director kept referencing was... Um, well, not spots, shots, was this one from Interstellar. The director really wanted the sort of the camera to be connected to the spacecraft, um, and he wanted this feel that you were going on a journey with the plane. It was like you were really part of Virgin and the airline and sort of travelling together through this magical world. Um, you know, so I think these kind of shots were really, especially for the taking off part, were really something that he wanted, wanted us to engage with. He wanted it to be physical, visceral. Um, you know, he sort of, like, I suppose what you're getting from this here is that everything's shaking, you're flying through the clouds, it's dynamic, it's like, it sort of, it feels like alive. Um, which is great, but, and it looks amazing, but obviously Virgin have their own ideas. Um, so as soon as we started showing them stuff like this and we had the plane taking off and the wings were all shaking and like, you know, super powerful, they were just like, no, you can't do that. It's just like the plane looks like it's going to fall apart, basically. <laughs> so, you know, so um, we had to sort of take a step back from that, uh, which was a shame because, you know, like we sort of enjoyed this reference as well and it does look amazing and it's a bit like in CG, any kind of like, any sort of tiny noise and shapes and things like that just help sell the physicality of it. So from our point of view, it's like we really wanted to do that, but we sort of understood where they're coming from. Either way, it's a great reference for just like look and feel and, and, and trying to get on the, in the mind of the director to what he's after and what he's trying to get shot-wise. Um, so he really wanted to be connected to the plane. Um, so obviously we then like start blocking out the shots for him. Um, this is kind of a mixture of kind of what you've seen before, I guess, which is that interstellar thing where he's connected to the plane, um, but the same, uh, but underneath it. And then some of the photo reference that we saw earlier of like we'd obviously seen a shot of the underside of the carriage of the plane, which looked really nice. Um, I think we, everyone sort of drifted away from the original idea of it, like being completely locked to the plane. Throughout the whole commercial, it was going to be like locked to it, and everywhere we flew. It uh, didn't matter if you were wide or close up, it was going to be a, a, a physical lock to the plane. But I think we sort of, as we started doing it and through the previous process, you quickly realised that it feels a bit weird. It kind of worked in this shot. You I mean, you've got a slight push in on there. Um, but, you know, you could sort of get an understanding that it's kind of, it, it sort of felt a bit rigid. Um, 
this again is quite a good illustration of sort of um, how useful Previs was without us actually having to render anything. This was all kind of like very fast OpenGL rendering with a matte painting in the background, some very simple lighting in direct lighting in Houdini and sort of very low res proxy clouds. But what it does allow you to do before you start getting into crazy heavy rendering is to visualize your shot and have a, a, an understanding of what it's going to look like, um, which is huge, especially with something like clouds because it just takes an absolutely huge amount of time to render these things. Um, and so, yeah, so the, it's sort of a good, good guide as to why the previous process and, and sort of taking it beyond grayscale can be really helpful sometimes. Oh, 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 sorry, I'm just trying to get all these notes up. There you go. Uh, challenges. Obviously, a shot like you just saw has got a huge amount of challenges in it when you're trying to make it look photo real. Um, it's like none of it is real. It's all completely generated from scratch. Um, you know, you've got a number of different elements in there. Um, a number of different physicalities that you need to copy, um, you know, especially because in this scenario, we're in the rainy, grisly world of London town. And so it's not only clouds in there that we need to create, we need to create a matte painting, we're going to have rain in there, um, atmospherics, heat off the engines, shake, shake camera, uh, camera distortion, things like that. So there were so many levels of things that we were sort of looking at um, and so many passes that were sort of generally needed to create the overall image. Um, you know, you sort of had to really break down and start looking at, again, looking at the reference and sort of saying, well, what does it actually, what does it, what makes up this shot and what's going to make it really feel completely beautiful? I mean, rendering a plane in itself is actually quite easy because the, once the model's made, all the details in the modelling and the actual elements of the plane work in your favour in CG because it's, it's, all, re it's all really reflective um, and quite simple surfaces, but the model's highly detailed, so it kind of is quite quick to, to render. Um, but you've got all these different elements on it as it comes through the clouds, which just take it to another level of complicated. If it was just flying up in the sky in the upper atmosphere, it'd be really, really easy. Um, but, you know, you start looking at all those different things. So you've got the heat haze coming off the engine, things that you don't really think about. Um, and, you know, that, that heat haze is also probably driving rain particles. So you have to sort of think, how are we going to emit those, you know, like off the surface of the plane? And that's a whole new setup that we hadn't really thought about uh, when we started getting going. There's the lights which are flashing all the time. And those lights have to interact with the clouds. So you're flying up through the clouds and the lights are turning on and off. Um, but like you don't quite know at the start of the job how much the client's going to be into having the lights on. Do they, is the light going to become distracting? You could end up rendering your sort of lights and then they're like, oh, can you just turn those lights off? And it's like two days to go and you just can't do it. Um, so one of the things we did end up doing was when we rendered every one of these elements, the rain, the clouds, the plane, everything, we had to do it twice, one with lights on and one with lights off, um, which was... Uh, it felt a bit, um, it felt a bit extravagant, but in the end, it gave the comp control over um, being able to turn those lights on and off, um, which was really, really useful because in the end, you know, the client would have a say about how like bright things needed to be, and we needed control artistically over how much is that light interacting with the, the clouds around it, and the rain around it. Um, you know, I suppose when you're sort of like comping these things together, um, having as many elements as possible help bed it all together and, and the control for the compositors will sort of uh, help make it look realistic. Here's a little sort of breakdown of what we did. Um, so you can sort of, you can see all the different elements on it. You've got rain running over the surface of the plane there. Um, you know, you've got all the sort of multiple levels of clouds that it's flying through, the rainstorms, the, the rain right close to camera. Um, we put a little bit of water on the lens so it sort of feels like it's flying through, uh, flying through a storm. Uh, you know, again, this, is, this came back down to the client. It's, it's always a slight balance between what the director wants, which might be um, very moody and artistic and, uh, and really creative, um, and he has his own vision, versus what, the client will want and Virgin will want to, you know, they, they, might wanna, they might have their own idea of the beauty of the plane, like it needs to be those pure white Virgin colours and, uh, you know, so you might be flying through a storm cloud but at the same time there's certain 
um, points which you need to hit. Um, hopefully this sort of illustrates like all those sort of parts that go into it. This probably isn't even all of them, um, especially, you know, the multi pass AOVs and things like that that go into the shot. But it gives you a good understanding of what was, what was put into it, I think. Um, the rain going over the surface of the plane was, uh, in the end, was kind of a quick cheat. Um, it, wasn't, it, wasn't anything, it wasn't a heavy particle system or anything like that. It's as simple as like noise running over the surface of the plane uh, as a bump or a displacement map. So little tricks like that are actually very light and easy to do, but it gives a really nice feeling to the plane and you know, it, it sort of makes it, it adds an extra bit of reality to it, which I think really helps. Um, so then we'll go on to uh, the next shots, which is as the plane comes out through the clouds. Um, it's blow, you know, this is the first point at which we really see it, where the plane is uh, burst out of the clouds and coming out into this light, magical world that we're going on an adventure with. Um, the, <clears throat> I suppose when it's sort of up in here, this was really the first point at which we're starting to look at everything and going, okay. Uh, now we've like, you know, we haven't done full CG clouds. Now this is the first time we're really going to see these incredible fluffy white clouds um, and the sort of, you know, it, it clearly needs to be beautiful. So again, we sort of start with the reference and we start looking at it, sort of what's it like when you're up in these clouds and what kind of, what's the formation of them and how are they supposed to look? What kind of different clouds are out there, I suppose, in, that, in this sort of like view that you would have? Um, you know, luckily, Again, there's all these beautiful references of these sort of like planes in, in these like nice illustrative um, formats. So, you know, the director wanted a very top down shot, it's quite clinical, and have it popping up, coming out through the clouds. So, you know, going back to, oh, hello. Yeah, there we go. Uh, the, yeah, so this is again an illustration of like the previous process. And this is, this was, uh, really uh, vital here, being able to sort of chat to the director about like, how's the plane flying? How many clouds are we sort of going to build? Because we're like, oh, if we've got to really sculpt all of these clouds and sort of like design each cloud individually and what's it going to look like, it's going to get quite complicated. And like, how deep does he want it? Does he want little holes in there to see through and to the ground? Like, should we be seeing London that we're flying over or not? Um, what's the lighting going to be like? Um, so, this was again like you know part of the previous process that was super helpful cloud creation uh was the next step like really i suppose this sort of obviously doesn't happen as you're doing a shot like that like as soon as you hear about the job you think right holy moly we better like figure out how to do clouds because we have done them before but not in this sort of scale and this this kind of environment they've been very much like background clouds and so um we know we needed to uh really get into like a very complex world of like what do clouds look like so you start having to look at a cloud like this and saying well, what is this cloud made of and like how do we eventually get there with the tools that we've got um, you know clouds in themselves are just made up of so many different varieties and types and looks you know it's not as simple as like bang let's make a cloud it's like right well what kind of clouds are we supposed to be seeing um, the client very much <clears throat> wanted uh, the plane to be up high in the sky so it didn't really ever because most most flying plane commercials uh, the, the plane is like in crystal clear blue skies like upper atmosphere 30,000 feet flying around which is where you'd see all these sort of cirrus clouds or I don't know alto stratus uh, sort of clouds so you have to get a bit geeky and start understanding like what are the sort of clouds that you're supposed to be seeing in this world the problem, though, was that the director actually wanted to be more in the clouds, and so we sort of needed a range of clouds and, like, different setups. You know, your sort of cumulonimbus, a quite fluffy uh, and sort of rolling, like, uh, you know, sort of quite defined, hard-edged in a way, and then some of the other ones have little softer, wispy bits to them. Um, so... Once you've done your sort of little bit of research and technical side of things, and we started getting into like breaking down what are the key clouds that we wanted. So, you know, we sort of had two different varieties. You had your sort of loose cloud by itself, and then you had a big blanket of cloud. Um, from that, we started re looking really into like how are you supposed to, how are we going to make these? What's been done before? Um, 
and what's out there that we can use. Obviously, Houdini's, as ETC, Houdini's one of our main tools and it's sort of our render package and our uh, bring everything together package. So uh, every, all the rendering and animation is going to be done in there. And so the clouds are obviously going to be made in there. And, and Houdini's got a great starting point for these clouds. Um, in looking at those, we sort of did a bit of investigation and sort of what can it actually do? What's it, you know, out of the box, what's it got? And what do we actually need to build as a tool set? Because, you know, the out of the box is amazing at what it can do, but obviously everyone's demanding a higher level. Everyone's expectations of VFX are so much higher now that you need to try and push it. Um, one of the amazing things is that Disney are very, uh, very good at um, handing out their sort of technical, technical work. So one of the things that they, they'd put online was um, a whole document and scenes of uh, clouds that they'd use in films like Moana. So, which was amazing for us because we could take those and go, right, this is incredible. Like, we can have a look at what they've done. So, we were having a look at the clouds. The only problem is that obviously a lot of what they've done is is built into their own tool sets, and so you can't deconstruct or change what they've done. You just can have a look at what they've done. I'm sure if we had enough time and we were on a film, we'd have a whole department that were just working on pure cloud building and make our own tools that would be incredible. But we didn't really have the time to do that because in a commercials environment, you have you know, two to three months probably. So probably three months or something like this. So you might have a month of like playing around and trying to figure out what you're doing before you're really up and running and trying to get into the commercial. Um, so one of our tech guys basically took that cloud and he sliced it up into pieces and he started to look at like how, how was their... Um, how was their cloud made? Like the actual, this one here, I think, oh, have I got it there? And it is, I think it, yeah, so I thought I had it up. But yeah, one of the clouds is very similar to this one on the top left is actually pretty much the kind of hero cloud that Disney had done. This, they, he, he cut it all into pieces and had a look and he sort of found that actually it was quite clear that it was made from two different types of noise patterns, really. One created a much more wispy pattern, which you'll sort of see at the bottom of the cloud, and the other one made it a sort of much bigger, fluffier one, which was what you see at the top of the cloud. So you can kind of see that in what we got in some of our sort of earlier tests down there, and the, 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 the top of the clouds have much big, more voluminous um, shapes pushing up and out, and then the bottom bit is much softer and lighter and wispier. So you have all these different sort of um, different patterns. Um, so really, it was us then uh, kind of reconstructing what they'd done based on our own tool set um, in Houdini. So the way uh, the way we went about it was to create curves. So like up there on the top left, you can kind of see we just draw curves, and those it's kind of quite basic, but that those curves could be converted into VDBs and they would create these uh, basic cloud shapes. And once you had a cloud shape, which we had control over, then we could start looking at combining our two different types of cloud that we'd built. So we'd built a wispy cloud and we built like a big fluffy cloud. Um, so it's kind of hard, it's not hard to show there on the bottom left one, but the idea was that it would create this sort of mesh. And within that mesh, um, you would have your cloud, which was formed. Um, you could then run a ramp through it, which could sort of say the top of the cloud should be one, one type of cloud variety, which would be the fluffy one, and the bottom, bottom of the cloud would be uh, the wispy one. And so it's, it was as simple as really blending two together. Obviously, it's not that simple. It's massively complicated, but that's the theory behind it. Um, so, yeah, I guess here is the... Here's the sort of breakdown of this shot, um, which I guess you can sort of see really all the elements and how they're broken down and, uh, and how uh, complicated some of those clouds were. Um, you know, like in each element and each layer that's put in there to sort of uh, to bring it together. Because it's not as simple as like, oh, you just kind of make a cloud, hit go, and it's done. It's like once it's, there's multiple different layers that, and styles of cloud that you might put together, little wispy patches or uh, different like segments higher up. A, you know, you can sort of see these ones closer to camera, which are just sort of soft wispy clouds. And then you have your main bulk of the clouds. Then you've got your god rays coming in there. All of these things combined are what's sort of going to help you sell your shot it's like it's unlikely you're just going to hit render on it and it's going to like it's going to look amazing um you know i think this is really this sort of shot really illustrates the power of comp and what it can do for you and how much control that they have over softening things up adding glows and balancing the shot out completely to sort of add like 
add that reality to it, you know. And I think the overall, um, the overall the end result looks beautiful. I think. Um, so I'm going to chat now about uh, the cross section shot, which I don't know if you remember. It all had all the sort of uh, balls in it, or the ball pit. Um, they when they came to us, it's sort of like. You know, we're sort of like trying to visualise what it'd be like, and you sort of got an idea of it, and you, you know, you could sort of see that this was one of the sort of first times that we're really seeing one of these stupid, sort of exciting, funny, like out there kind of moments. You know, one of these sort of like departing the everyday moments, I guess, that run through the commercial. Um, but obviously, it was a it was a slightly tricky one in that it takes um, a sort of different level of design because you obviously have your plane, and now we need to start thinking about what's it going to look like inside. How's it? You know, what sort of levels of detail do we need to go to? We need to like kind of build a whole new world inside of this plane. Um, they decided in the end that they were going to shoot the inside of the plane because we had the set anyway with all the chairs. So we were like, right, cool, great, we'll just shoot all the chairs and they'll be done. But we obviously then need to design what's in the plane. So, you know, we've all kind of been to museums and it, it did feel like one of those museum pieces where you sort of go and marvel at how beautiful and intricate all this engineering is that, that's, that's there and how clever they are that they fit all the luggage and all the sort of food or cargo into the into the plane underneath it um, you know it's sort of uh, it, it's a really again the reference is key and that we sort of knew we could look at an image like this or go to a museum and go right great we sort of know what we need to build now um, everyone was kind of bought into that to begin with I think everyone's you know some of the creators were a bit not creators the clients were a bit skeptical like how's it going to look um, so we sort of got it into got it into previous and started mocking it up you know with the footage that was shot so obviously, before we went on the shoot, we'd obviously done a quick mock-up of this so that when they shot the plate, they knew what angle that they should be shooting the inside of the plane and how far they needed to be away um, from the set so that the angle works. That's one of the things that when you're shooting live action to be combined with CG, the previs before the shoot is really, really important um, because it just solves loads of problems for you later. Like if you didn't really do that, you wouldn't have pushed in on the camera giving you the parallax and you wouldn't have got the angle that was correct for this shot. Um, because this is one of the first times the client had really seen the sort of shot coming together, they were like, I think everyone was kind of buying into it and they're like, yeah, that's exactly what we'd sort of seen on the boards and we really like it. Um, but uh, there's something not quite right about it and they basically had the issue that it was pretty much like look downright dangerous and it was like why is the plane chopped in half we don't quite understand it um it also in the commercial like a few shots later there's a man falling through the sky like you know falling into clouds and they're like if you weren't really watching this properly there's like a plane in half and a man falling out of a plane <laughs> probably not that fun um so you know from this point it was like there was uh, they were sort of we were kind of getting late in the game with it. It was like a week or two to go, and everyone's like, oh, "Okay, uh, all right." Uh, so we thought, "Are well, they going to drop the shot?" But everyone loved the shot, but they just didn't know what to do with it to sort of creatively sort of get it working. Um, really, what they wanted was that they the whole idea of the commercial was it's fun, uh, it's exciting, and obviously from the client point of view, it needed to feel safe. Um, and so uh, and so really, it was like back to the drawing board. Like, how are we going to? What are we going to do, and how are we going? To, how are we actually going to be like? How are we going to be fun in this shot and keep it exciting? Um, obviously, underneath is like where the cargo all goes, and so there's quite a few different ideas about like, right, what are we going to do? And they're like, oh yeah, let's have the luggage down there, and the luggage are all like dancing around, having a really fun time on their holiday. You're like, right, okay, uh, yeah, it's sort of running out of time, so that's going to take ages. Um, also, just quite complicated, you know, but we've got to build all the luggage, animate them all. Will you even see it? Because it's actually, like, not that big in shot. So there's a lot of, like, creative um, chats that are going on about how can we solve the problem of this shot. Everyone wants it, but there's a problem with it, and it's, it's quite a big problem in that the client is just not going to buy it. They're just not going to accept it um, in its current form. Uh, so there's a bit of going around and like, yeah, there was talk of like gummy bears and there, like giant gummy bears, which is kind of like cool and it's sort of like quite fun. But again, like, yeah, sort of technically you're like, oh, it's quite complicated. Like the lighting and rendering is going to take absolutely ages. Um, 
so in the end, everyone had everyone sort of came down to the idea of um, the ball pit because it is like it's sort of everyone has that sort of fond memory of the ball pit and and how fun it is. Um, and uh, you know, the other thing that came in was the fact that like, okay, great, we solved that. Now the problem is, it still feels like the plane's being chopped in half. Um, and so, what are we? How how are we going to? Now we sort of solved the ball pit thing. Everyone sort of bought into that. We did a quick test. Again, Houdini at its best, like making something like this, like just loves it, laps it up. Um, but then it was like, right, well, the plane still feels like it's being chopped in half. Um, and, you know, it's sort of like we need something to sort of bind it all together. So this, as you can see, this big swirl came out of it. Um, and that was like almost like a vortex of sort of magic, I guess, which was, from their point of view, really helped um, in in combining it all together and sort of making you, uh, making you, oh, wrong one. Um, yeah, combined the whole shot and just sort of made you understand the fact that it was like, you're still in this tube. Um, you know, you're still in this sort of plane. It's just that uh, it's not there because we're having a sort of look away at it. Um, you know, that, that sort of vortex was put together in the last week, basically. And like, luckily we'd sort of had some setups already, but you know, luckily it worked and it, it actually looks super cool and um, graphical, I think, is one of the sort of like, one of the sort of standout shots that we did. Um, so it went from being one of the sort of troublesome shots to actually one of the sort of more interestingly creative and, and beautiful shots. Um, so I'm just going to, just to finish it off, I'll just play you through the whole commercial as a breakdown. Um, obviously, the whole thing was like very complicated, and I've only had time, unfortunately, to sort of go through a few of the shots and a few of the sort of setups that we did. But you know, the commercial itself had a number of different things, a number of different challenges. Not only just the CG, which is one huge part of it, but you had big problems with like filming a guy walking on a roof and uh, of a plane, and then you had like ice cream coming out of a uh, out of a vent that didn't work properly and that had to be fixed entirely in 2D. There's, there's constant challenges uh, in, in commercials and it's kind of what keeps it exciting, keeps you on your toes. So I'll just play you. Uh, Yeah, you can sort of see from that, I guess, all the complex 
levels of detail that go into like making a commercial and uh, hopefully you sort of enjoyed it sparked some sort of thoughts in your brain some creativity uh i've got five minutes left i don't know if anyone's got any questions hey. Yeah. No, the cl well, the clouds were sort of, uh, I suppose we built different levels of clouds. We had proxy clouds. They, uh, in the end, they didn't actually need to animate, luckily. It didn't need to flow. So they just kind of all stuck in the world. It's purely their movement is just coming from the sort of camera moves. Um, but yeah, Houdini, uh, Houdini's getting better at animation. And something simple like this, we were like, it, we sort of want to try and do Houdini more because as a Houdini studio in animation, it's sort of... Um, it's a good thing to just all do in one package so you're not moving around packages. Normally we do all our stuff in Maya. Um, but yeah, this is quite simple and plain animation and camera animation is pretty linear in a way. It's like quite simple. So yeah, we were lucky with the clouds that they weren't actually evolving and forming. There's obviously the one with the vortex coming through, but that's sort of, that's a separate particle sim that goes on rather than necessarily animating it. Um, you mentioned that you uh, used Houdini for everything. Do you use uh, Mantra or do you use another render engine? Uh, yeah, we do mainly use Mantra. Um, that's a sort of brute force thing. We're sort of, we're sort of drifting into and trying out all the different other renderers as well. Um, we're looking at Redshift, but really something like this is not ideal for Redshift. Like it's, Redshift would be good for the plane, but it wouldn't be very good for any of the volumetric sort of stuff, um, or it wouldn't be the right tool for it. Yeah, I mean, a whole, a whole setup is built on the fact that Mantra is a free renderer, and it comes with the package. You just need the engines to convert convert the file so we can have a massive farm and fire up like loads of additional render farms on the cloud if we need really easily without having to have multiple licenses for something like Arnold's or, or something like that. But I mean they're all kind of similar. I think like a lot of these renderers now they do have their advantages and Arnold's obviously one of the sort of leaders in the sort of photo real film world but it's all kind of changing a little bit. Everyone's sort of trying out new things now so um, Mantras definitely does, does pretty well for like you know for what it is I think. Thank you.